Good morning. Welcome to this October 20th Sunday, a gorgeous day out there as compared to last Sunday. Church Council will be meeting today following the worship service. Next Sunday, we invite you to come back for Reformation Sunday. Uh, David Potter will be playing. Always a fun yes. Sunday when we have David Potter playing. And then uh, Carol Kay is okay, but she had a fall um, at New Perspectives, and so they transferred her now over to Villa Marina, where she'll be now at Villa Marina. And if you want to send a card or anything, we've got her address out in the back table there, and Randy is there this morning cleaning out uh, her, her apartment there at New Perspectives, so keep them in our prayers. And Jan has an announcement. Some of us will be meeting this Thursday um, between 10 and 3 to work on the bazaar, up rapidly. So if you can help out, stop in any time. Um, we're going to be putting together bakery boxes and hopefully working on some projects. So um, hope you can hope you can join us Thursday. Thank you. So Jan is inviting people to show up they're not working during the day. Ten till two on Thursday. Helping with the bazaar which is a yeah, wonderful event. And we are continuing on now with our narrative lectionary as we're going through the Old Testament. And we are finally to the story of David. David is mentioned in the Old Testament 1,100 times, just in the Old Testament. David is mentioned more than Abraham and Moses. So I've been spending this last week really dwelling into David's story to try and get it to two Sundays. We'll do David this Sunday and next Sunday. Trying to really understand the importance of David in our life of faith as we are ancestors of faith. So the story today with David is we've been talking about the Ark of the Covenant and David is going to bring the Ark into Jerusalem. And he brought in the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem with loud music and very joyful. That's where we get our Psalm 150 from. David wrote many of the Psalms, was a, a musician himself. So that is why we are singing today, we are marching in the light, that sense of the joy when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in. And with that, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you to join me in the call to worship. Come, let us worship God. And all the people. Confession. O God, our King and our Maker, forgive us when we try to make you in our image. Forgive us when we turn to earthly rulers for the wisdom and strength you have already shown us. Hear the words of forgiveness. Come, we are the brothers and sisters of Christ, all are forgiven by grace. Praise be for Christ's love. Amen. I invite you to stand and sing our gathering song. We are marching in the light, hymn 866. Thank you. 
text today is from Mark, the 11th chapter, and this is when we would read, and you'll listen for it, Palm Sunday, when Jesus comes into Jerusalem. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. The gospel of our Lord. So before I read the Samuel text, uh, get out your timeline and we'll review the timeline. We started out the first Sunday. September, stories of creation, dedicated our windows, creation of light. The early stories, uh, things didn't go so well. Cain killing Abel, God wanting to destroy the earth, sends the floods. People decide to try and build a tower. God's not happy with that. They try to be like God. God decides to start over through one family, the family of Abraham. God promised Abraham and Sarah's descendants would be as numerous as the stars. And that through them, they would be a blessing to the nations. And then we get Isaac and Rebekah, and Isaac and Rebekah have Jacob. <clears throat> and Jacob then has the four mothers of Israel, and there they have the beginnings of the 12 tribes of Israel. They're jealous of Joseph, the other 11 brothers. They sell him off into slavery. Famine happens. All the brothers end up in Egypt where they will reside for 400 and some 60 years. And they are now enslaved under Pharaoh. The people cry out to God. God hears their cries. And God is going to work through Moses. 
Then we all go through the Moses stories. And then we have the plagues, the, the uh, plagues. And then, of course, the last plague being the death of the firstborn, which is Passover. The angel of death passed over. If you had the blood of the lamb painted on your door. They escape from Pharaoh through the Red Sea. And notice that they're saved, they're redeemed, and then God gives them the law, the Ten Commandments up on the mountain. Well, Moses is gone for 40 days and 40 nights, and the people have already forgotten, and they decide to make the golden calf and worship that instead of the true God. Moses intervenes. God does not destroy the people again. In the meantime, our unsung hero, Bezalel, instructions from Moses, who was up on the mountaintop, makes the Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant contains the Ten Commandments. But most importantly, that is understood to be the presence of God. Two cherubim, these angel-like things, face in. It's about six feet. And the lid is called the Ark, the Seat of Mercy. And that is where God's presence presides as they then wander the next 40 years in the wilderness. By day, a cloud, by night, fire. And God is with them in that tabernacle and then within the Ark of the Covenant. They follow the Ark of the Covenant at the end of their 40 years through the Jordan River. Again, kind of like the Red Sea, the Jordan River splits, which leads them directly into Israel. And then uh, they start conquering the people who were in the land. And we have the time of the judges, which is 160 years of time. And on the back side of your map, you'll see where the 12 tribes in Israel resided. And then uh, you can see the names of the land surrounding them, those of the peoples who lived around them. Various times in that history of Israel, they're being attacked. They're being attacked as they try and occupy the promised land. God raised up Deborah and Barak, which was last Sunday's story. Judges, again, is a book, um, not very fun reading, very horrific violence. But then, a nation becomes a kingdom. We're not going to do this year the King Saul story, but... The 12 tribes, loosely federated, um, are going to be consolidated under King Saul because they said, we want a king. Samuel the prophet didn't think that was a very good idea because he told him exactly what a king was going to do. Essentially, a king has become another pharaoh. <coughs> so King Saul was anointed as the now consolidated kingdom. But Saul is going to find disfavor in the eyes of God. And then David is going to be anointed, chosen by Samuel the prophet and by God as the next king. And that is where we're going to pick up our story today. We're not going to do the very early story. But there you see on your timeline, Ruth. Ruth, the beautiful story of Ruth. And Ruth. A Moabite, a foreigner woman, is going to become the great-grandmother of David. Her grandson's going to be Jesse. Jesse's going to have 12 sons. And God has told Samuel the prophet where to find their next king. He looks at all of Jesse's sons, Samuel the prophet does. And Samuel says, no, 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 none of these are going to be your future king. And Samuel says, my gosh, is there anybody else left? And David is a young boy. He's out in the fields. He's a shepherd. He's bullied by his brothers. They think very little of David, the youngest brother. And lo and behold, this shepherd boy, David, is going to become the new king. We all know the story of David and Goliath. So, a reading from 2 Samuel, the fifth chapter. 
If you want to follow along with me in your Bibles, um, I actually printed such I don't have the page number. But if you want to find it, 2 Samuel chapter 5. David anointed king of all Israel. Then all of the tribes of Israel came to David at Hebron and said, Look, we are your bone and flesh. For some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. While Saul was king over us, when Saul dies, it's going to be six years of civil war. Think Game of Thrones. I've never watched that series but this is the violence that's happening. David, not Kenya, and Saul, and Saul's sons are going to be at war for six years. David was walked with God. The Lord said to you, it is you who shall be shepherd of my people Israel. You who shall be ruler over Israel. A king was meant to be a shepherd. Shepherds were viewed very highly at this time, and a king was meant to be the shepherd. So all the elders of Israel came to the king at Hebron. Now David is out of the tribe of Judah, the southern kingdom, and made King David a covenant with them at Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. So now all of the tribes are united under David. David was 30 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 40 years. At Hebron, he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned over all Israel and Judah for 33 years. Now I want you to get out your maps. When you have the 12 tribes loosely confederated, and if you look there in the center of your map, you'll see Shiloh. That was the religious center before David comes into power. And that is where the Ark of the Covenant stayed in the tabernacle tent at Shiloh. Now, you see just below Shiloh, you see Jerusalem. Okay, now I'm going to pick up reading, which is not the lectionary, and we don't ever read this in church. Jerusalem made capital of the United Kingdom. David the king and his men marched to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land. David cannot come in here, they said. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion, which is now the city of David. Jerusalem was originally not. It wasn't a part of their cities. David conquered it. And God blessed that and said that was good. This is where the new religious and political center is going to be. David occupied the stronghold. Jerusalem is up on high ground. And named it the city of David. David built the city all around. And David became greater and greater for the Lord, the God of hosts, was with him. Now, David is pretty smart. He's just been at six years of civil war with Saul's sons. But he is called to unite all of the tribes of Israel. So in him conquering Jerusalem, if you look on there, you can imagine there's kind of a border between the southern tribes. Simeon kind of got drawn into Judah and then the little tiny tribe of, of Benjamin. And then north of Jerusalem, that's the northern kingdom. So David selected his political and religious center. That's just like would be equivalent to our Washington, D.C. That would be Jerusalem. It wasn't a city known to either side. It's the new Washington, D.C. Part of the reason why well, David selected Jerusalem. And there you see just south of Jerusalem, that town of Hebron. You heard that mentioned earlier. Hebron is where Sarah, Abraham and Sarah, promised to bring you many descendants. That is where Sarah died and where Sarah was buried, was in Hebron. Now in the meantime, 
towards the end of Saul's reign, they were being attacked a lot by the Philistines. We've heard through the years about Philistines. Um, Goliath came, was a Philistine. And they had the idea, they asked that the Ark of the Covenant come out from Shiloh and go forth with them into battle. And that's kind of where you get, you know, if you watch Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, why the Nazis were after that in, in the Indiana Jones film, is it thought, if you had the Ark with you in battle, nobody could defeat you. That's why the Nazis wanted it. So this is kind of where we get some of that history. So they bring the Ark with them there on the shore towards the Philistines, and the Ark gets captured. Not a good day. The Philistines are in control of the Ark, the presence of God. It doesn't go well for the Philistines. Well, God sends plagues on them, and we don't cover those stories, but eventually they send the Ark on a, uh, I guess, a, a trailer, hauled by two animals, and they just send it off, and the Ark finds its way back uh, to a safe keeping. So now David is in Jerusalem. And we pick up now with 2 Samuel chapter 6. David brings the ark to Jerusalem. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David and all the people with him set out and went from all Judah to bring up from there the ark of God which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who is thrown on the cherubim. And there you have a, a painted glass window um, on your bulletin cover. The cherubim are those two creatures on top of the ark. You kind of see that power emanating. That was an artist's depiction, that power emanating. Think of the Ark of the Covenant as kind of like a nuclear power reactor. You had to treat it with much care and respect. They carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out to the house of Abinadab, which was out on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God. And Ahio went in front of the Ark. David and all the house of Israel were dancing before the Lord with all their might, with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals. And that is what God loved about David that David loved God. So now, the ark, um, I guess you don't need to look at your maps, but the ark is going to leave that land of the Philistines. And there's some stories associated with how the ark finally ends up in Jerusalem. But we won't go there today. So David went and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed to the city of David with rejoicing. And when those who bore the ark of the law had gone six places, he sacrificed an ox and a fatling. And David danced before the Lord with all his might. David was girded with a linen ephod, that was priestly clothes. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. So, the Ark now is in Jerusalem, the religious capital. And again, David is mentioned over 1,100 times in the Old Testament. The ancestors of faith remember King David as the Golden Age. But we all know David screwed up pretty bad. We, David is not, other than his love of God, we are not to paint him as a hero. The adultery with Bathsheba, and then he has Bathsheba's husband killed. David has seven wives, which was not uncommon at that time. And the sword, with all the violence in David's family, David is gonna be a horrible father. And all of this violence among his sons is gonna play out. But David knew how to repent, and David never lost that sense of 
prostrating himself, laying down when he, before God and asking for forgiveness. But this Ark of the Covenant, as Lutherans, what we find really interesting, again, when at that time, with all the foreign gods that were around them, when they would build temples to their other gods, little G-O-D-S, their deities, and they would put an image of that god in their temple. But what, think about this, in the Ark of the Covenant, God did not want idols. God, they did not put Bezalel, when he built the Ark, did not have a graven idol image. They put in the Ten Commandments. The tablets is what carried with them. And the Ten Commandments are a gift of life. The first three commandments, how we're to be with God. You are to have no other gods before me. I am the Lord of God who brought you out of Egypt, who redeemed you. Have no others behind before me. Do not take my name in vain. And then all of the other commandments, how we're to live with one another. That was complete gift. If we were living with each other, according to those commandments, we would be in a peaceful society. So in the center is really the word. And we believe how God comes to us is through the word, through the sacrament of baptism, and through the sacrament of Holy Communion. Faith comes through hearing. And this is where God promises to meet us. We no longer have the Ark of the Covenant, but God promises to meet us in God's Word. Amen. Next Sunday, we will pick up with God's covenant with David, 2 Samuel chapter 7 which is really going now um, to set us for God's promise through David and continuing on through David's line through Jesus. So we are singing Change My Heart, O God, hymn 801, um, for the love of God that David did have for the Lord and that David was willing to have his heart changed. Uh, you may remain seated for this, hymn 801, and we'll go straight into the prayers and for our online congregation, I will say, change our heart, and I invite you to respond with, oh God. the world and the whole creation. Holy God, we give thanks for all servant leaders of the church. Bless bishops, pastors, and deacons with humble wisdom and ground them in your love. Change our heart. Creative one, 
We give thanks for the delicate balance of the natural world. Kindle in us a spirit of caring strength in the preservation of habitats, food availability, and centers of refuge that all wildlife may thrive. Change our heart. Empowering one. Fill the leaders of governments with a spirit of service that prioritizes those on the margins due to job loss, underemployment, unsafe working conditions. May economic equality be achieved for all people. Change our heart. Restoring one. Send your angels to watch over, rescue, and protect those who are injured or ill. Nurse those who suffer hardship, disease, injury, or difficulty with your comfort and peace. And those we now name silently or loud. Change our heart. Abiding one, you call pastors to shepherd the congregation toward faithful living as servants and followers of Jesus. Inspire all ordained ministers and seminarians to ministry that challenges, engages, and comforts those in their care. Change our heart. Saving one, we give thanks for all your saints who have faithfully served you. We rejoice in a promised place at the feast of victory that we receive by your grace alone. Change our heart. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the saving grace you freely give, both now and forever. Amen. The peace and love of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share that sign of peace with one another.
Let us pray the prayer our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name.
We'll now all sing the doxology together.
Be well in Christ. Christ is with you. Thanks be to God. Go in peace as we uh, leave today. Uh, we are marching. You don't need to have anything else for that. We all know that.